Uh, welcome to our third Company of Scholars lecture for this academic year. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, my friend and neighbor, Gary Tomlinson, uh, whose uh, work I'm eager to hear about because we, I'm very interested in music, but uh, we don't speak about uh, his work socially in our neighborhood. <laughs> so uh, uh, he, uh, Gary's the uh, John Hay Whitney Professor of Music and of the Humanities here at Yale, and he came from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's a PhD uh, graduate of UC Berkeley from uh, 1987, and the next year he got a MacArthur Fellowship, so you must have written a smashing thesis, Gary, to, be, to receive that kind of recognition. for the, uh, for the graduation. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That's, that was incorrect on your Wikipedia page. <laughs> First mistake ever on Wikipedia. <laughs> So Gary is the author of uh, five uh, learned texts on, on music and also the co-author of a popular uh, music appreciation book. Uh, today we're going to hear about his current work on the evolutionary emergence of music uh, in, among mankind and his uh, lecture topic today is One Million Years of Music. Gary? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for all coming out on this balmy spring afternoon. Um, I, said, I said to my undergraduates on, on Monday, at least we're done with the snow. And they said, don't jinx it. They were, they were right. Uh, uh, the, the title that you see on the screen in front of you, I, am I mic'd appropriately, by the way? Is everything OK? All right. The title you see on the screen in front of you is the title of a book that will be coming out in the coming months. Um, and I want to say two things about this title. Um, uh, number one. There were not one million years of music, um, uh, not of human musicking, to be sure, um, though Rick Prum just told me he's going to do 150 million years of music. That's a different musical story than I'll be telling today. Um, uh, there were not one million years of music, but the point of the title is to say that unless we look back a long, long way in hominin evolution, we're not going to get any full picture of how it is that musicking, musicking capacities, musicking is a term I'll use a lot, musicking capacities came about. And the second thing about, to say about this um, this title is, note the assertion in the subtitle that, that somehow talking about one million years, uh, that is the emergence of music and capacities, could in fact tell us something very general about the emergence of human modernity all told. I'll have a little bit to say about that um, later on in, in the talk. Um, it certainly is a major theme toward the end of the book. But let's start uh, with something much, much more recent. Let's start with the end of the story that I want to tell. Um, here is a, a, a wonderful, cute little artifact uh, that was unearthed not so very long ago. Uh, this uh, comes from the Swabian Jura, that, is, that, that uh, uh, region of the, the Swabian Alps to the southwest uh, uh, portion of, of Germany, where near the uh, source of the Danube River, um, uh, sev in several different caves over the last several decades, and in, fa in fact in some of the sites even farther back, but certainly over the last uh, few decades in a number of different caves, uh, uh, an arresting uh, array of artifacts have been unearthed. Um, this one is one of the cutest, one of the most wonderful. It's about this big. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, carved out of uh, mammoth ivory. It is the figurine of, of a woolly mammoth. It is one of a series of figurines that come from Fogelherd Cave in uh, one of these sites that, uh, that I just mentioned. There is a famous horse. There are several other mammoths. There, are, there is a feline figure. There is a, a, a bird. Uh, there are several different, uh, 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 there's a whole array of these from, from Fogelherd Cave. Uh, now, the Artifacts that I'm going to show from this region of near the, the mouth, uh, uh, near the source rather, of, of the Danube River, these, um, these artifacts take us back to what ar archaeologists think are, are the earliest um, uh, artifacts or some of the very earliest artifacts made by Homo sapiens in, uh, in Europe. Um, uh, do we know for sure that they were made by Homo sapiens? We don't know much of anything for sure about these things, but, but it is almost, almost undoubted that they must be the product of Homo sapiens. All the behavior that we know of the one other species that was very prominent of hominins at this time in this region, that is to say Homo neanderthalensis or the Neanderthals, suggests that they were not up to this kind of handiwork though they were up to some pretty significant and sophisticated handiwork. Um, so from, this, from another cave, Holenstein Stadel, um, uh, from this same region comes the famous lion man of Holenstein Stadel. Um, this, is a, this is a statue, again, of mammoth ivory. It's about this big. It was first unearthed in 1939. Uh, in 
Uh, it was not put together. It was not even seen to be a puzzle that needed to be put together until some, uh, some archaeologists looked at it some 30 years later and pieced it together into this striking figure uh, of a humanoid body and, and a feline, uh, feline head. I'll talk more about this uh, a little bit later. From this same area of all of these, uh, uh, of all of these caves uh, at the, uh, near the source of the Danube uh, uh, come the earliest musicking artifacts that we have, uh, and I'm going to show you a, a, a series of these now. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a pipe from uh, Geissen Klosterly, another one of these uh, sites. It is uh, made from the, the radius, one of the wing bones of, of a very large swan. Uh, this is a fragmentary pipe, a fragment of a larger piece. Um, uh, it, you can see that it has been repaired and pieced together from a lot of uh, fragments in which it was found. Um, uh, Note the, the, kind, the construction that would have been involved. The, uh, the, the bone would have been hollow to start with. The ends of the bone were sawed, sawed off uh, and, and then using a rasp of some sort that, uh, working transversely across the pipe, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the holes were fashioned not by drilling into the pipe but by scraping until, uh, until a hole to the interior was opened, thus giving it that characteristic beveled effect that you see in the finger holes. Here's from, also from Geisen Klosterly, from about the same period, is, um, uh, is uh, a pipe made uh, in, a, in a very, very different and more complex fashion. This now is made of mammoth ivory, and you can see um, you can see a number of features of this. In order to make it of mammoth ivory, they had to cut longitudinally, split open a piece of ivory, hollow it out on the insides, and then glue it back together, uh, making finger holes, in this case probably with an awl, drilled into the, into the ivory because the ivory wouldn't break the way the swan radius might have. You can see the seam running off the side where, uh, up the side where it was sealed again. You can see the, uh, some notches along the side that seem to have been made in order to help make the seal uh, uh, more airtight. Maybe the adhesive, we don't know what adhesive was used, maybe some adhesive was, was sticking better when they made those notches. The, the little tag up at the top, of course, is not part of the artifact. That's an archaeologist's tag. Again, made from mammoth ivory in this case. Now, in, 19, in 20, uh, 2008, rather, um, uh, uh, some more artifacts started turning up in, in the, the last of these, these uh, Danube Valley sites that I want to talk briefly about. And, uh, and these are uh, special for several reasons that I'll, that I'll get to in just a moment. Here's another um, uh, Apparently musical pipe. This one fragmentary still, but four four holes uh, uh, four holes well preserved, and perhaps another hole down at the bottom. Maybe another hole up at the top. Uh, made now from the radius of a griffin vulture. Um, uh, this pipe from Holofels in, uh, unearthed in 2008 by Nicholas Conard and his team. He is one of the lead researchers in this whole area at this uh, at this moment. Here's another picture of it with a singularly sinister uh, uh, vulture holding out its arms, so we can see just what bone was used. Um, uh, and I made. Sure that I had this right because I thought Rick Prem might be here. This is, it's not the bone that is highlighted here. It is this bone, the top bone. This is the radius. This is the ulna. Um, uh, the ulna also used in some other pipes for, um, uh, for uh, in some other uh, archaeological artifacts as well. Uh, these hollow bones were very useful for these musical pipes. Um, again, showing the, the clear effect of beveled finger holes. It also signals a mistake that archaeologists often enough make. One might assume that, oh my goodness, think of, think, they're, they're thinking ahead to making airtight seals by beveling the finger holes, just the way we might in a, in, in a, in a, uh, in a modern recorder. And yet, as I've already explained, the beveling is a necessary effect of the way in which the finger holes were, were, uh, were made into the interior. A handy, um, serendipitous uh, uh, outcome, perhaps, for, for making the airtight seal, uh, but not necessarily something that they had to think about in advance. Um, this pipe was found at Holofels um, uh, uh, right alongside. It's so close, in such close proximity with the next artifact I'm going to show you that for one of the rare instances at this historical depth, um, the archaeologists surmise that, that the same people might have been involved in making both of these artifacts. This is the so-called Venus of Holofels. Uh, rather arresting Venus um, figure. Uh, Venus figures are famous from the Upper Paleolithic period in Europe, but all of them, uh, except for this one, are much, much younger. Uh, and I'll talk about the age of these, of these artifacts uh, just now, in fact. Um, the, 
the, uh, uh, all of these artifacts sit at the far end of the reliability of carbon-14 dating, so it's been very, very hard to get, uh, very, uh, to get accurate dates uh, of these artifacts. Uh, the problems ha have to do with the short half-life of carbon-14 and the trace amounts that are there in the first place um, that are then trying to be measured six or seven half-lives back. Uh, it has to do also with, uh, the, um, with the calibration and the changing amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over these periods. The calibration curves for carbon-14 dating are very, very difficult and and, and uh, controversial things. But the calibration curve now for carbon-14 has been pushed farther than it had been until recently and takes archaeologists with confidence back well beyond 30,000 years and in some cases almost to 50,000 years. Some would argue almost to 50,000 years. These artifacts stand in carbon-14 dating now somewhere between 40 and 44,000 years ago. These are hugely ancient artifacts, in other words. They are, they are very, very, very distant from us. They might be as little as 5,000 years after the final exodus of a couple of lineages of Homo sapiens came out of Africa to populate the rest of the world in the first place. That close to the migration out of Africa, maybe only 5,000 years, maybe more, maybe 10 or 15, but as little as 5,000 years. They're hugely ancient artifacts. And to give you a sense of the chronological span that we're talking about here, if we look at the next oldest pipes that, that um, uh, uh, archaeologists have come across, there's a whole series of pipes, some 21 or 22 pipes, that came from Isteritz cave in, uh, in the Pyrenees in the Basque region of southern France. Um, uh, the, these pipes, uh, they were unearthed early. This one has a dating, 1914 there. You can see another dating, 1939 there. The two halves were, not, were, were, were uh, excavated some decades apart. Um, uh, this series of pipes, uh, they date back 20 to 25,000 years, probably something on that order. Um, they, are, they are, in other words, some 20,000 years younger than the pipe that we were just looking at from Holofels. Um, they, uh, uh, there is one pipe that is, that is thought to be, was asserted to be by the archaeologists uh, of an older vintage, um, and yet the stratigraphy of the, of the excavation and the similarity that was, was not done very precisely back in the 1930s. And the, uh, the, the similarity of design between that pipe and all the others suggests that it was not, in fact, uh, chronologically separated very far from them. So those are Isteritz pipes. The next, the next oldest uh, uh, musical artifacts we have, uh, 20,000 years younger or so than the pipe from Holofels, um, or some famous Paleolithic, uh, uh, Paleolithic handiwork. This is the, hall, the famous Hall of the Bulls from Lascaux in the Dordogne of, of, of uh, France, of central France. Uh, you can see the aurochs that dominates the scene with horses superimposed over it, and there's a reindeer down at the bottom, and some characteristic abstract marks painted uh, around it that are very, very frequent in these Paleolithic paintings and very enigmatic. Um, the Hall of the Bulls dates back something like 17 or 17.5 or 18,000 years, much, much more recent once again. If we want to push back the history of, of uh, Paleolithic cave painting on the monumental scale of Lascaux, we can push it back to Grot Chauvet from the eastern, eastern portion of southern France, discovered only in the 1990s. Here is the famous panel of horses from Grot Chauvet. Uh, some of you may have seen Werner Herzog's movie, uh, uh, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams, on uh, a very romantic but quite marvelous pictographically, uh, uh, cinematically, um, uh, exploration of Chauvet. It, Chauvet was immediately closed. Uh, it has never been open to the public. As soon as it was discovered, it was, it was closed, closed for archaeological study. Um, uh, this, this panel of horses, at first it was asserted that it was 30 or 32,000 years old, which makes it arrestingly ancient as well. Uh, the, that, that dating has now been begun to be revised down into the 20s. Once again, we're still uh, 10,000 years at least uh, younger than, uh, than, those, than those, those artifacts from Holofels. And if we want to go back farther to artifacts that have some sort of sense of usage about them that is not utilitarian, that is to say, not, not, not just tools for scraping and cutting and so on and so forth. We can do that, but in order to do that, we need to, we need to head out of Africa, uh, out of Europe and into Africa, in fact. And here is, is the, the, the poster child, so to speak, for early so-called symbolic behavior among Homo sapiens in Africa. Sim that word symbolic is a deeply pernicious one in archaeology these days, and, and I try not to use it without careful definition, uh, but it's usually talked about as symbolic behavior. Here it is from Blombos Cave on the southern coast of South Africa, a piece of incised ochre. It's about four inches long, about this big. 
Um, the incisions have been studied to a fairly well. Uh, they were made with some sense of design involved in, in scraping them into this, and there are many other pieces that have been found in Blombos Cave now of similar antiquity uh, to this that have other incised designs on them. This was not, in other words, the haphazard uh, product of cutting some meat on top of a piece of ochre or something like that. Um, the, um, uh, uh, this, this piece dates back to uh, more than 70,000 years, 70 to 77,000 years, 73 is the, is the name that is usually, that is, uh, the, the number that is usually assigned to it. All right, now all of this archaeological evidence of, of musicking, uh, specifically those pipes and so on that I've been showing you, all of this archaeological evidence is the end of the story that I want to tell. And the question is, how can we describe the earlier stages? We need to Come, we need to make some general statements, first of all, about music and human or hominin evolution. Uh, and and the, the, the three terms that I, will, that I will highlight in these general statements are, first of all, uh, any such complex behavior as, as human or human musicking needs to be thought of and needs, its, its emergence needs to be thought of in incremental terms. We need to take the behavior apart into its, into its, uh, into its component parts and understand how and why those components might have emerged rather than taking musicking as a whole and trying to say, why did music Music emerge. If you read accounts of the origin of music, of which there are many these days in, 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 the, in the literature, uh, some of it popular, some of it, some of it scholarly, uh, you will see again and again the mistake made of, of, uh, of people trying to say, well, how did music emerge? It must have emerged because people wanted to bond socially, so they started doing music. Or people wanted to sing to their infants, so they started doing music. Um, these, of course, just beg a whole lot of questions about how it is that capacities for making music came to the species in the first place, why it is those capacities uh, that came no doubt for non-musical purposes, coalesced into musical practices. All of those questions are begged by the notion of taking music as a whole as the, as the object. So we need to have an incremental account. We need to have an, a co-evolutionary account. Um, co-evolution uh, I will talk uh, about in some detail in just, in just a moment, so I'll come back to that and leave that aside for the moment. We need to, uh, we need to have an account that involves culture. And by culture here, I mean something that can be defined very straightforwardly and very simply. I mean the, the, the notion of learned behaviors in one generation that are then passed along through mimesis, teaching, and various other, uh, various other behaviors to successive generations. I don't mean more than that by culture. And with that definition, culture is a very, very widely dispersed uh, phenomenon in the animal kingdom. If you read Michael Pollan's recent article in, in The New Yorker, uh, you might know that some people would say culture is widely dispersed in the plant kingdom. I don't go there, in fact, but, um, uh, but certainly it is widely dispersed in, in the animal kingdom. So we need an account that, that in other words, uh, gives us an incremental biocultural co-evolutionary uh, picture of how it is that, that, uh, that human musicking um, uh, took shape. So first we talk about some increments then. What are some of the increments? What are some of the basic capacities that are involved in human, in human musicking? Well, some of them are very ancient, very widespread, far beyond humans, and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and very general in their application. Auditory scene analysis, as it is sometimes called um, by people who study music cognition and other sound cognition, by the way. Auditory scene analysis named in analogy to visual scene analog uh, analysis. How is it that our brain takes a, 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 a jumble of of, of oral signals from, the, from the, the world, all kinds of noises and other things, and separates them off into, into, into distinct streams of sound, right? How does our brain make sense of the auditory scene around us? Um, how does it, uh, distinct, distinct oral streams is one aspect of it, distinct rhythmic pacings would be another aspect of it, uh, distinct acoustic amplitudes, directionality from which different sounds are coming, all of these are part of a very, very general, generally dispersed uh, auditory scene analysis, widely dispersed throughout mammals to be sure, and, and, and birds also to be sure, uh, and some, uh, probably some other, uh, some other animals as well, uh, in probably lowering levels of, of, of complexity, but not necessarily. Um, so auditory scene analysis is a very ancient and very broad uh, basis on which musicking might happen. Hierarchic processing or perception. Uh, this is much less basic and much less widely dispersed. I, I think it is arguable uh, that, that in certain forms, hierarchic uh, co cognition and, and processing um, is very narrowly limited uh, to, uh, to a few clades in, in, the, uh, in the animal kingdom. Um, by, hier by hierarchic processing, I mean the capacity to take, to take 
stimuli from the external world and process them in such a way that they begin to nest themselves. Uh, a number of stimuli uh, nested in, in, in relation to fewer stimuli nested in relation to still fewer stimuli. Uh, this is fundamental to modern human linguistic capacities, is fundamental to modern musical capacities uh, in human musicking as well. Part of the fundamental, the one marker of the fundamental aspect, uh, the fundamental uh, uh, importance of hierarchic processing has to do with the perception of periodic rhythms in, uh, in, in human musicking today, by which I mean rhythms coming, uh, st stimuli, oral stimuli coming at regular, uh, at regular uh, time intervals. Um, the, the capacity of, of hominins to entrain themselves to, um, to regular stimuli from the environment is an astonishing capacity, astonishingly, astonishingly complex. In fact, it is sometimes known by music cognitivists as beat-based processing, referring to the beats in metered music, of course. Um, uh, this, uh, this perception of periodic rhythms is not as widespread beyond uh, humans in the world today as we might think. Some of you may have, uh, may have looked on YouTube at Snowball, the, the white cockatoo, dancing to the Beastie Boys. Well, maybe, um, but aside from, aside from a few animals, uh, non-human animals in close proximity uh, uh, that have been raised in close proximity, domesticated in various ways and raised in proximity with humans, it's hard to find really clear examples of the kind of beat-based processing with its hierarchic ordering of, of, of uh, regular stimuli into larger groups, uh, 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 larger groups uh, of, of those stimuli. It's hard to find many instances of this uh, in the animal kingdom. So the perception of periodic rhythms and entrainment and beat-based processing, all of these are related phenomena tremendously basic to music and human musicking. The sensitivity to pitch, we might think, well, uh, isn't that the same thing as the sensitivity to sound? But of course, it is not. Uh, humans manage to distinguish for one reason or another, and it doesn't take music training to do this. It simply is something that we grow into in our normal socialization and ontogeny. We distinguish uh, those sounds that come to us from the world that have a fundamental frequency and then overtones above that frequency ordered in simple integer ratios, two to one, three to three to two, four to five, and so on. We distinguish those from other sound stimuli that come to us in the world. Those things we give the name pitch to, whatever name we want to give to it, it doesn't matter. The other things sound like noise. It is the difference between da and that's got an incredibly chaotic array of overtones uh, above the, the fundamental frequency when I, when I uh, and, and if you beat on a bass drum, it's the same thing. But the pitch that I just sang has an ordered uh, uh, array of overtones or partials above its fundamental frequency. This capacity of our brain to do this is a hugely mysterious capacity. It might have to do with neural networks that are in, in which the neurons are somehow firing in those, precisely in those ordered uh, simple integer ratios. But if so, we haven't been able to test this and find this and locate this very clearly yet. Um, uh, the explanation for the, the actual kind of neural e explanation for many of the things I'm talking about today remain quite opaque and mysterious. But sensitivity to pitch is fundamental. Uh, and from it, by the way, arise the kinds of distinctions of timbre that, that, we, that we make use of in music all the time also in language, but in a very different way in language. Sensitivity to timbre or tone color has to do then not only with the, the, the overtones above a frequency, but it has to do especially, there are several aspects to it, it has to do with the onset of, an, of a sound, the decay of the sound, all sorts of things. But one of the most important aspects has to do with the, the, the different weighting of overtones above a fundamental frequency. So that if a trumpet and a violin play the same pitch, the reason we hear one is different from another has to do with the differential weighting of the partials above the fundamental frequency uh, that is played by both instruments. Um, Distinctions of timbre. Timbre, by the way, in language is tremendously important. Vocal, uh, v vowels in, in all human languages are distinguished by, by, by rather discrete application of, of, di of different timbres within individual languages. The perception of discrete pitch levels then is only slightly, is, is, a, new, is a different kind of wrinkle that I'll talk about more later on top of this sensitivity, uh, sensitivity to pitch. This perception of discrete pitch levels or intervals um, has to do with the fact that once hominins at some point came to be able to discern pitch, and here it is different from disordered noises in the world, um, they're set in at some point a very general capacity to relate pitches to one another in hierarchic modes of one sort, uh, of one sort or another. So hierarchic cognition is involved here again. And this has to do, for instance, with what in Western uh, musical parlance we call octave equivalence. A, a pitch with a fundamental frequency here and a pitch with a fundamental frequency twice that fundamental frequency sound incredibly closely related to human listeners. 
there's some evidence that there are some other species, macaque monkeys, certain birds, but not other birds, also hear this octave equivalence and perceive it, but it doesn't extend hugely as far as experimental evidence has, has shown us so far. So octave equivalence, once you've got a sense of, of this octave equivalence, the, 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 the spectrum of pitch sounds that come, uh, can be broken up into smaller intervals, also related typically by small integer ratios, three to two, four to five, six to five, and so on. Um, these, um, uh, uh, these smaller intervals, in fact, give us the, the scales that are used in, in, musics, in musical systems all over the world. Are they in any sense fixed? No, they are not. Uh, the, the arrays, uh, they, they, uh, it, is, it is pretty clear at this point that musical systems tend to choose pitches within the octave that gravitate towards certain central points. But these pitches are marvelously malleable. The gravitation points are, so to speak, attractors in, in, a, in, a, in a very, very interesting complex system, but they, don't, uh, they, are, not, they, are, not, uh, they are not determinants and they are not in any, in any way fixed. Nonetheless, once again, we, hear, uh, we see in this phenomenon of, of discrete pitch um, the play of, uh, the play of, uh, of uh, uh, simple integer ratios somehow entering into our, our, our uh, perceptual structure. One of the basic lessons to take away from this whole slide that I've spent so long on is that there's no such thing as simple music. Um, people long ago, um, uh, linguists long ago, uh, realized that in natural human languages, none of them are simple. They are all, they are all ordered in extraordinarily complex ways and they, and they require a complexity of cog a cognition that is essentially unknown outside of, uh, beyond, the human, beyond humans, uh, homo sapiens in the world today. Um, the, the same is true of music. There is no such thing as simple music. A, 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 a mother humming a lullaby to, uh, to a, a nodding child on the one hand, uh, 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 a group of football fans chanting, a, a chanting their team's chant at, at, uh, in a football stadium, um, may be simpler in many, many ways than a Malarian orchestra playing or than a gamelan, a 30-piece gamelan uh, band playing in, in, in Bali. Yes, it is simpler. And yet all of those phenomena have already crossed over a bar of such huge cognitive complexity that the differences between them are insignificant compared to the difference between musicking and non-musicking, ultimately. Okay. Now I've just brought up the, the, the question of language. And of course, we can't talk about the advent of human musicking without talking about the advent of language as well. Um, the, um, the, uh, an incrementalist view, which I think we have to take into language just as well as, as we have to take it to, to human musicking, an incrementalist view is going to suggest finally that, 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 these, that increments uh, were Reach, reach back, you know, the increments of modern language and the increments of modern human music reached back far before either musicking or language existed. These increments were f falling out in hominin behaviors and capacities for a long, long time. In some of the most general cases, they reach very far back, but in the cases, the more specific cases that I'm talking about here, as I've said at the beginning, the last million years or so will get us a long way in trying to understand how they came about. Um, but um, uh, these, parallel, uh, these parallel components, the, these components fell out in, in ways that are moving forward through the evolution of hominins in still distinct and separate ways, and finally perhaps overlapping in some ways, uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, di quite distinct from one another in other ways, but they are, un they, are, they are developing at a moment when there is no such thing as language and there is no such thing as musicking. Right? Neither of these exist for a long, long time yet to come. So here's a very simple and very bad uh, uh, use of PowerPoint chart that might, might show something like this in schematic terms. There you have a million years back. Here you have a set of capacities that are represented by the arrows. There you have, oh, on this left-hand side, you've got capacities that, are, uh, that, that on the far side are more and more specific to human musicking today. On the right-hand side, capacities that are more and more specific to language and speaking uh, today. In the middle, you've got a broad range of capacities that overlap and that are used, that are made use of in both musicking and language. But the point is that the ages of these different capacities are vastly different. And there is some moment of, of coalescence, a long moment of coalescence, mind you, but a moment of coalescence that probably happens, in my estimation, after 100,000 years ago, when modern musicking and modern language fall out. They both coalesce out of these uh, sets of, uh, of components that had been developing for a long, long time. Now, if we're going to take this incremental view, it raises the question immediately of the proto-music and the proto-language that came before. 
So what can we surmise about the nature of this proto-music and this proto-language? Say, 500,000 years ago, a group of Homo heidelbergensis uh, at Boxgrove in, in southern England uh, trying to, uh, in, with a complex social, complex social uh, interactions, uh, they're scavenging a hippopotamus skeleton, the skeleton has been unearthed, the tools with which it has been, ha was scavenged have been unearthed, and so on. Um, they're, uh, they're working hard, they're working as a group to fend off the hyenas that also want to scavenge the, the hippopotamus uh, carcass. Um, what kind of complex communicative network can we imagine for, for this group? Um, uh, we can surmise a whole lot from, first of all, what archaeologists tell us about the social organization of these groups and the social possibilities. They, they, uh, uh, they extrapolate this especially from stone tool making of various and the techniques involved. We can surmise a whole lot from primate communication and behavior in the world today. We can look to some other sources as well for, for our speculations. They are speculations, of course. Uh, but first we have to assert that it is a complex communicative network that was at stake here. There is no language, there is no modern musicing, but there is a complex communication at stake. It probably involved both innate and learned vocalizations vocal gestures and also bodily gestures. These gestures probably had the first, uh, the first burden of carrying an affective charge from one of these individuals to another co-present individual. So the emotional charge was first and foremost in what was expressed in all likelihood. That emotional charge aimed at manipulating the other individuals around so that they would do the things that the person who was expressing these emotions wanted done. There probably were gestures and even vocal gestures that pointed towards, towards in things in the world, towards other individuals and so on. Deictic gestures, as linguists tend to call such things. Um, and the signals are almost undoubtedly not discrete in the, in the manner of modern language. I'll come back to that discreteness later. They were rather, it was a, it was a question of analog signaling. Uh, analog signaling signals that, that vo especially in the vocalizations, because discreteness comes easily to bodily uh, uh, to bodily signals, but it comes less easily to, to vocalize signals. This, um, uh, this analog signaling uh, would, would have involved a graded spectrum of signals, so that, so that ah means one thing, ah means something else, ah means something else, and yet the one thing and something else and something else are not clearly distinguished from one another. They simply are carrying larger charges of affect, larger manipulative charges, right? Um, uh, so analog signals. Um, the question then would be, what processes could transform this kind of communication into modern musicking and modern language? And now we turn from increments uh, and incrementalism to coevolution and the nature of coevolution. And here's a very, very basic sketch of what I mean by coevolution in the first place. This is, this is fundamental uh, in evolutionary thinking today. Uh, it certainly it, it reaches all the way back. It's very clearly signaled, if with a slightly different vocabulary, already in Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Um, and here it is. What I mean is something very simple, a feedback network between organism and its environment. And the, the environment, by the way, including all the other organisms in it, whether of the same species or of different species. You've got an environment that is a selected terrain that is exerting some kind of selective pressures on an organism or a group of organisms or a species and so on. You've got an organism or organisms or species that are at the same time, um, at the same time altering the environment on which they live in the course of their life ways. And what happens is, is that, that the, the, and in the term that is usually used, the niche of this organism is slightly altered by its own life, uh, life ways of the species, the organism, whatever. Uh, the niche is constructed by the organism at the same time as the organism is constructed across natural selective time scales by, um, by the impact of, of selective pressures. A changing environment, the changing environment brought about in, in part by the organism. Simple feedback, uh, a simple feedback model seems to me is basic to the definition of, of coevolution. This feedback, by the way, once again, the it includes all of the network of organisms in, in this environment, not just the inert, inorganic environment. Um, this is, in essence, the entangled bank with which Darwin finished, very famously, his On the Origin of Species. The, once we start talking about cultural animals, however, remember, animals that, that learn behavior in a lifetime and then teach it or pass it along somehow to successive generations. Once we start talking about cultural animals, we get into biocultural coevolution, which is a rather different animal entirely. And, and here's, uh, here's a slightly enhanced model of the feedback network. In this case, part of the niche constructive feedback to the, to the, uh, to the environment 
has to do with, in fact, the cultural behaviors of the species that is involved, right? Those cultural behaviors uh, can be collections of behaviors. They can be even, even rather discrete collections of behaviors. I call these discrete collections of behaviors archives, cultural archives. And, and hominins have for a very, very long time been, uh, been putting together cultural archives that they then pass along to successive generations. These archives have immense power to alter the selective terrain more power, one might argue, than many other kinds of non-cultural behaviors that, that animals might be up to, though not more in all cases. So let's look at, at a simple example of a cultural archive. Here is an Acheulean hand axe from about 700,000 years ago, uh, uh, a biface, um, uh, uh, rather symmetrical, uh, made from, from flint napping or stone napping of one sort or another. You chip down a, pe a, a larger core until you, uh, until you get, to, get to the shape, um, uh, a shape something like this. This, uh, uh, this Acheulean uh, 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 technology came in first about 1.7 million years ago. It's immensely ancient. And once it settled in, it became a cultural archive of huge permanency and stability. Um, it lasted for another million years before, in fact, there were really significant um, uh, changes in the technological toolkit of the hominins that are our ancestors and other hominin species as well. Um, the, 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 the point about this as a cultural archive is that there was a collection of gestures that was needed in order to, be, to, to, in order to somewhat reliably come out with something that had some semblance of symmetry um, as the biface that was, uh, that, that was, that was sought, uh, that could be used as some sort of tool. Um, this operational sequence, as archaeologists tend to call it, this operational sequence is the cultural archive, as I'm envisioning it. Right? It, is, it is an archive of behaviors, a collection of behaviors that comes to have some sort of coherency to it that is then passed along from generation to generation. All right. Things get then a little bit more complicated because there's one more wrinkle to this coevolutionary model, as I see it. Um, as cultures begin to sediment themselves, as archives in, hominin, in the hominin clade in particular, and I think it's arguable that there's no other, there's no other group of animals in which uh, this phenomenon happened to anywhere near the same extent, but already early on by, say, 500,000 years ago, those Homo, Homo heidelbergensis cutting up the hippopotamus carcass, already early on, these cultural archives are coming to be sedimented, as I would put it, getting, they're getting deeper and deeper in their complexity. The things that are passed along, the body of archives that is now passed along from generation to generation among hominins is getting more and more complex and, uh, and, and more and more sophisticated. Um, as this happens, there is, there is the possibility of something new. I call this something new, uh, a, a cultural epicycle. So here is now epicyclic biocultural coevolution. You've got the same, the same kind of feedback model is, is, a, is at stake here. Uh, you've got cultural archives that are, that are, uh, that are, uh, that are taking a part in the niche, con that are taking a, a major part in the niche construction. But at the same time, every once in a while, you have these, uh, a falling out of a rather systematic array of, of, uh, of, uh, of cultural behaviors, a systematic array that for various reasons takes on its own, its own systematization, its own formalization, its own ways of moving somehow, that comes almost to have a life of its own, not as a living thing, of course, but as a, a collection of behaviors. And once it does this, it extracts itself ever so slightly from the feedback cycle. It becomes a, uh, what I'm calling, again, an epicycle. It, it, it becomes a, a set of behaviors that, that in its own formality, in its own formalization, has now, has now come to, to carry its own complexity and generate its own complexity. And once it does that, it can then feed forward into the, the, the main feedback cycle, uh, the coevolutionary feedback cycle. A feed-forward element, the only difference between a feed-forward element and a feedback element is the independence of the feed-forward element from the feedback mechanism. And it seems to me that what is happening in, uh, crucially over the last, say, 500,000 years ago that differentiates hominin evolution from every other kind of evolution that had happened in the world before is the proliferation of these, these formalized epicycles of cultural behavior that then take on a role as a feed-forward uh, element in, in the, the larger uh, flux of, of feedback. So let me, let me give you two examples, one musical, one not, of, of, uh, of, of these epicycles. By the way, I don't draw the line in any very firm way as to what we want to call an epicycle and what we might want to call a slightly looser array of cultural behaviors. Could we call 
the Acheulean hand axe uh, uh, set of behaviors in Epicycle? Sure, uh, why not? It certainly came to have something of, of, of an independent life of its own as it was taught again and again and again through tens of thousands of generations of hominins, not in one species, but in many different species. Think of that, a technology that extends across many different species, lasts for over a million years in a very stable form, um, and yet is a cultural attainment that is taught again and again and again. A cultural attainment, of course, based on fundamental uh, innate capacities of various sorts, but nonetheless a cultural attainment. So here are a couple of other examples, of, of more uh, clearer examples, it seems to me, of what, of what I mean by this epicycle. Here is the, the bead-making epicycle, for instance. Now, bead-making, by which archaeologists mean any little object that a hole is drilled in so that it might be hung on hair, it might be hung on clothing, it might be hung on a string to make a, make a necklace or a bracelet or something. Bead-making is hugely ancient. It, uh, the earliest instances we know are about 100,000 years old. It is very widely dispersed, in fact, so widely dispersed that we cannot believe that, that in fact, this was a matter of one group of hominins teaching another group of hominins how to make beads. Uh, in some cases, that no doubt happened, but in many other cases, it seems to have popped up independently uh, from, uh, in, in various groups. Um, so how did it happen? Well, here's one model of how this epicycle might have taken shape. Uh, you, in a situation of, of growing social complexity, a situation in which uh, that, that we can see from the technologies and the burgeoning technologies of these groups, say 100,000 years ago, we're not talking about Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, mm, the advent of Homo sapiens is now placed something like 200,000 years ago. Um, uh, but uh, the uh, the um, in in a situation of growing social complexity, there uh, part of that social complexity might well have been uh, the the realization of, of different kinds of alliances within the group. They might have had to do with kinship, they might have had to do with aspects of invisible statuses that were, uh, that were involved, uh, that, certain, that accrued to certain members of the group, ranks and so on, the chief of the group and so on. Um, uh, this is an expression clearly of hierarchic cognition once this kind of sociality sets in. Uh, hierarch hierarchic cognition is long since, since present in hominins. Uh, Neanderthal tool making shows very, very clear instances of, of hierarchic organization. Um, uh, uh, but under the influence of this new appearance, so to speak, of invisible aspects of culture, rank within a group, for instance, um, under the appearance of this, in, the, in the, the presence of all kinds of skilled material workmanship, what could be more natural than that small objects would be taken to decorate bodies with and to mark, so to speak, the otherwise invisible status of individuals. Um, what could be more natural than that there might be a proliferation in many different hominin groups, including Neanderthals, perhaps, uh, though bead making among Neanderthals still remains somewhat controversial, um, uh, but certainly many different uh, Homo sapiens groups. What could be more natural than, than that there would be a, not just a proliferation of this epicycle, this particular bead making epicycle, but in fact, um, uh, a, a repeating of the springing up of the epicycle in very different far-flung places, and by the way, with very far-flung materials. It can be seashells, as, uh, as, as you see here. It can be, um, uh, it can be uh, minerals in some cases. It can certainly be bones and teeth. They're very frequently used. It can be ostrich shells, which are very frequently used in, in northern and western and eastern Africa, and so on. All right, a simple example of, of, uh, of uh, a cultural epicycle. Here's a more complex example, the case of discrete pitch, and then I will, then I will conclude. I'm loading you up with all kinds of things here, and I hope there will be, uh, uh, there will be some, some questions afterwards. Um, a more complex epicycle. In this situation of increasing social complexity, we have a, a situation necessarily of increasing communicative, communicative complexity. Um, the, communic the vocal gestures that I talked about in proto-language and proto-music are, uh, are now proliferating, they are getting more and more frequent, they are getting more and more elaborate perhaps. Um, the, the, we could imagine easily enough a sharpening distinction of intonational elements that would be used in making some of these signals. But if you take an analog graded spectrum and you start making sharper and sharper distinctions, you come up with a problem because the closer things are on that analog spectrum, the less, you can less easily you can differentiate them. The signals are not working any longer. There would be a pressure at some point for a discretizing, a making discrete of, in fact, the graded analog spectrum. Um, I think the, exactly what happened in, in the case of, of animals that were already perceiving pitch and perceiving it differently from the noises of the world, the percussive noises of the sort that I, uh, uh, the, uh, that I just exemplified, um, I think what happened was, uh, was precisely in these animals that were already hearing pitch, 
uh, uh, pitch came to be a more and more discrete element along these analog signals. But something interesting at this point happened, a divide between the overall contours, intonational contours of utterances that we still use to express ourselves today in language and in music, overall melodic contours, overall contours to speech phrases and so on, the prosody, as linguists call it, of, of speech. Um, uh, that never went away. That ancient, that very, very ancient part of, of proto-language and proto-music, and that was one of the older components, it never went away. But what happened was that pitches, individual pitches, came to be abstracted from that, af uh, that affective signaling. And once they came to be abstracted, the systematizing of pitch arrays that I talked about before, octaves and smaller intervals within the octaves, began to fall out according to the capacities that depended on small integer ratios for hearing pitch in the first place. You get a cultural epicycle that is pushing towards an abstraction of discrete pitch from the general melodic contours that are still a very, very powerful element of communication, both proto-musical communication and proto-linguistic communication. What happens then, we can easily imagine. Uh, in, 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 uh, uh, there would be new socially effective uses then for these pitches, and I'll talk about some of those uses in just a moment. But I want to emphasize once more this new, this new distinction that has come about between general melodic contours and discrete pitches. This is a distinction that is very operative in human musicing today. It is a distinction that is operative in a rather different way in human language, especially tonal languages, which have intonational structures, large intonational structures across phrases, but also have some discrete tones that are used, of course, to convey uh, meaning as well. The epicycle, uh, then, of discrete pitch. All right, so the coalescing, then, of human modernity, say, 120 to 60,000 years ago, it seems to me that it involves fundamentally this abstraction of thought and cognition. And this abstraction of thought and cognition is falling out at the same time in the conversion, so to speak, of proto-language proto into modern language, of proto-musicking into modern musicking, of social practices that are now taking on increased complexity with invisible realms attached to them. Ranks and statuses and other sorts of kinds of organization, new complexities recognized in kinship organization. One, the argument has recently been made that, that somewhere, with, uh, somewhere uh, uh, back from 40 to 80,000 years ago would have been a time when, when kinship systems of the sort that humans universally recognize today in their societies, of a huge array of sorts that they universally recognize, would have come into focus for the first time. Uh, whatever we take, out, we take out of these specific arguments, what is happening here, in the most general sense, is what anthropologist Morris Bloch calls the appearance of the transcendental social. Bloch talks about the transactional social, co-present individuals working out transactions so as to, so as to get what they want in, in, in the social organization of which they're a part, these are hugely dispersed in non-human uh, animals in the world today and very, very complicated in non-human animals in the world today. It is arguable that at least uh, beyond certain very rudimentary levels, the invisible realms of social organization are unique to humans in the world today. Um, and that is the, what, what Bloch refers to as the transcendental social. So the burgeoning of transcendental sociality then involves, for instance, language, language pragmatics, that is to say, a, a discourse that was proto-linguistic and is turning into modern language that is nonetheless, in, in which there are certain kinds of, of orderings of, of, uh, of, of exchanges and so on and so forth, taking on the much broader and much, uh, uh, much more predictable ordering of modern human linguistic discourse, a movement from, what, uh, from language pragmatics, what linguists call pragmatics, to what Michael Silverstein, uh, 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 another linguistic anthropologist, has called metapragmatics. Metapragmatics would have appeared. Musical capacities, musical capacities now falling out in terms of organized performative circumstances in which these capacities would be called upon. And once we get to organized performative circum uh, circumstances, to performances, in other words, we're talking about something that comes very, very close to the notion of ritual in its modern and absolutely ubiquitous human guise. We're talking about, in all of this, about offline sociality, not, in other words, I can react and communicate up with my co-present indiv individuals about the saber-toothed cat that is threatening us, but we can sit around a campfire thinking about how lucky we were to have escaped the saber-toothed cat that threatened us earlier today. Offline sociality, offline um, communication. 
with all of this, this, this appearance of the transcendental social come imaginary realms, come minimal counterintuitions, as this little statue is called. It is counterintuitive because it puts a humanoid body with a, uh, with a, uh, a, feline, uh, a feline head, and yet it's minimally counterintuitive because both the feline and the human are very, very, are very, very, um, uh, uh, are very, very familiar. What we see across this period, in other words, from say 75,000 years ago to 40,000 years ago, is it seems to me the move from that as, as some sort of proto-symbolic behavior in the world to this as, as a full-fledged sense of a ritual transcendency about human existence that can be expressed in language, in music, and in ritual behavior of all sorts, and in sociality in general. So, so what was going on in Holofels 40,000 years ago? Well, I think it's probably something very similar to what was going on at Chauvet maybe 30,000 years ago. That's the, the, the famous panel of the, of the, the felines or cats. Um, or something very similar to what was going on another 10,000 or so years uh, closer to us at Lascaux or Altamira. Here's the, one of the famous bisons of Altamira, same age more or less as the paintings at Lascaux that I showed you earlier. Or now we, now we see that these, these, these expressive realms of humanity have taken on monumental proportions, right, in the paintings of, of Altamira or Lascaux. And those monumental proportions are, it seems to me, stand in a direct line to this next uh, place where something similar was going on. Gobekli Tepe, uh, sir, about 12,000 years ago in southeastern Turkey. That's been, it's been excavated only over the last 20 years. It is an astonishingly early, huge ritual center. We don't know what it is, and yet it took a technology that we wouldn't have imagined any hunter group, hunter-gatherer group at the end of the Paleolithic and beginning of the Neolithic had the capacity to do. Um, it, it, uh, it built these huge stone stelae with, or pillars with, with scorpions and birds carved all over them. Uh, there were many of these, these, uh, these complexes. Uh, there seems to have been nothing but a hunter-gatherer society around as far as archaeologists can tell. This Gobekli Tepe is a complete mystery unless you see it in the line that I have been tracing back, straight back through from the early Neolithic all the way back through the, middle, uh, the, the upper Paleolithic and all the way back indeed to the African uh, Middle Paleolithic or Middle Stone Age as it is called. And if we take that straight line, that continuous development, we see that, that what's going on at Chauvet and Lascaux and Altamira and Gobekli Tepe is in fact not so different from what's going on in Jahu, China. These were for some time claimed to be the earliest musical instruments. They are something like 8,500 years old. They are carved with a, with, with a technology. They are made, constructed with a technology that is, in fact, now almost 40,000 years old among humans by the time these things are made. Almost 40,000 years old at 8,500 years ago. Um, uh, they are made by making holes in hollow bird bone flutes, in this case, uh, in bird, bird bones, rather. In this case, the, uh, uh, the bones of red-crowned cranes. Uh, so in all of this continuity that I'm pushing here, um, what we get is an alternative to the old revolutionary views about how human modernity came about. The sapient revolution 200,000 years ago, then it was all different. Well, the more we learned about Neanderthals, the more we learned that they were extremely complex creatures and, and with ex doing extremely complicated things. Um, uh, those things are, are, are badly preserved and hard for us to discern, and there are a whole lot of fights and arguments about them among, uh, among archaeologists, but there's no question they're, they're very complex. The more we learn about the ancestors of Homo sapiens in Africa, the more we see them up to very great complexities as well. Uh, the, so the sapient revolution begins to fade a little bit. The upper Paleolithic revolution around 40,000 years ago in Europe certainly faded a long time ago. There are those who want to transpose it into Africa at, say, 60,000 years ago, uh, but I think even there, there's a more gradualist kind of, kind of uh, a coalescence of forces that is involved rather than some revolutionary change. The Neolithic revolution, well, the continuities between the, the monumental structures um, uh, of the pyramids and then another 8,000 years back, the Gobekli Tepe, and another only 6,000 years back or 5,500 years back, uh, Lascaux and Altamira, those continuities suggest that the Neolithic Revolution has been overly, uh, overly marked off. It has to do with agriculture and sedentism and so on, but we learn more and more that 
the domestication of crops and animals was a gradual incremental development too. It didn't just start at the, at the, uh, at the beginning of the Neolithic. We learn more and more that sedentism existed, that is to say sedentary settlements existed long before the beginning of the Neolithic. There are, uh, there are uh, very stable and quite permanent um, uh, villages on the Ukraine, uh, on the Ukraine steppes, made out of mammoth tusks and mammoth jawbones at 18,000 years ago. Now these people were hunter-gatherers, they were hunting mammoths clearly, from the building materials they used. Um, uh, but they were still building stable structures and long-lasting structures, and structures that were absolutely immovable. So all of these boundaries begin to, all of these clear boundaries that people want to, to paint begin to, begin to fade. The axial age at the first, in the first millennium before Christ is another of them that I, that I think is a highly dubious set of judgments uh, about, about novelties, supposed novelties at the time, revolutionary novelties at the time. Um, instead, we get the gradual appearance of modernity, gradual appearance, and not just, across, not just for Homo sapiens, but across several species. We get the coalescence of these, these features of modernity, prob probably finally in a small population of humans around 60 or 70,000 years ago in East Africa, a population of humans that then, uh, that then populated not only the non-African world, but as genetic studies are more and more clearly showing, moved back into Africa and populated the African world. They're meeting there with Homo sapiens groups, some of which had been separated from them for tens of thousands of years, and meeting up with them again, and interbreeding with them. And, and it seems to me that if there is a coalescence, if there is some one moment at which this coalescence happens, it needs to be a tremendously ancient one, it needs to be a long moment, and it probably is, is located in this small population. But once the population begins to spread in different places, it meets up with populations that are already burgeoning with their own epicycles. And these epicycles merge with one another in various ways. These cultural forces merge with one another. We get a whole uh, very, very complicated history that is being traced out now of climate change, of population migrations, of the homogenizations of populations, and genetic homogenizations as well. Uh, homogenizations as well. And we get um, this repetition and proliferation of epicycles. And from all of this, it seems to me, we begin to construct something when we look back that is an immense continuity, um, uh, traceable in gradualist terms across the longest periods, uh, lo much longer periods than we have tended to imagine, and bringing about through this epicyclic kind of coevolution uh, the, the shared modernity of all humans in the world today. Thank you very much for listening to all my words. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Gary has already invited questions, so let's hear from the audience. Steve? Gary, can you define the necessary and sufficient conditions that you would use to recognize an epicycle and, and distinguish it from something else? So if you're just taking all the kinds of stuff that can go on in cultural transmission, which is quite varied, mm -hmm. how do you put stuff into the epicycle basket and how do you keep it out? Well, in the first place, Steve. Oh, sorry. This is here. Excuse me? Oh, was that question not heard? How do you define an epicycle? Is there, is there some necessary and sufficient set of conditions that would allow one to define an epicycle? And I already said that there's not, in my view. That is, we might see, we might see something like, uh, like the Acheulean hand axe as a cultural epicycle, though if so, it seems to me the loosest of, of sor uh, sorts, an epicycle of the loosest of sorts. I will say this, in the most powerful of these epicyclic um, uh, formations, um, there, is, there is a kind of, a, a kind of uh, to use a word that is used altogether too much these days, but which uh, some of us are using in a seminar right now to try and figure out, there is a kind of emergent complexity that comes about that is a very, very special sort of thing. It has to do with whatever the elements are, that, that uh, uh, behavioral elements, acoustical elements in the case of music and language and so on, other kinds of elements, material interactions with the world in a particular circumstance. But out of that conjuries of elements, sometimes um, something very formalized can, can fall. Uh, Terence Deacon has a long argu uh, argument about, about symbolic behavior. He defines symbolism uh, and the advent of human language much more carefully than most archaeologists who want to talk about it. His book, The Symbolic Species from 1992, was a very, very important one, it seems to me. Um, what he sees, for instance, in, in as a crucial moment of the coalescence of language would be, for me, another epicycle. Uh, that is, he sees a moment at which signs of certain sorts are coming to be indexical signs, as Charles Sanders Peirce would call them, pointing signs, signs that indicate things, deictic signs, as I was saying before. Those signs are coming to proliferate so much in human communication that at a certain moment, the, even, even the, 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 the necessity to remember the signs is such that there is a phase transition of sorts into a set of signs that 
that are self-referential and come to have their meaning because of the nature of the set itself. That defines for Peirce, it defines in some crucial ways what he means by a symbol. Uh, many, for many Saussurean linguists and many other linguists, it defines what, how language works in a fundamental way. For Deacon, he argues that that, that that would be a very, very important moment. He, I think he overplays how important it was in hominin evolution. He sees language. He's a linguocentrist. He sees language as absolutely central to everything. Um, Nonetheless, I think he's on the right track, and I think, that, I, I think that, that, that that is a great example of a very careful, of a very clearly formalized epicycle. Necessary and sufficient conditions, no, I don't have them. But something similar, I think, is happening in discrete pitch, whereby the, the acoustical uh, small integer re relations, the winnowing down of graded, uh, of graded analog signaling systems into, into discrete elements falls into a kind of processing that then makes a part of our expressive vocabulary the, uh, uh, the, the production of discrete pitch. So I can't formalize this epicycle, but I know it when I see it. No, no I, don't, I don't mean to say that. No, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't mean that. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think, in fact, the attempt actually to formalize it and make the boundaries that you're asking for is something I don't want to do. I want to see a graded move towards more and more complex burgeonings of these cultural systems, all right? Something like that. Please. So you mentioned uh, about human homo sapiens about 200,000 years ago, and then at the last slide you had 60,000 right. years. So our sense of what the difference is like on the discrete pits, did the 200,000 year homo sapiens have discrete pits? And or did it take until 60? I'm trying to get some sense yeah, yeah, as yeah. a novice of what the differences uh, I, I think, are. I think uh, uh, this is this is hugely. Uh, it is the center of of Homo uh, of Homo sapiens of sapient archaeology right now. Trying to figure out what happened be between say uh, something I don't know 175 to 200 thousand years ago is what the genetic evidence points to as the advent of Homo sapiens. Well, how reliable that is in the first place is one question, and I'm not equipped to to make a judgment on that. But something on the order of that, let's say. Let's just take us for, for, uh, to try and answer your question. The distance between that and the appearance of distinctly modern human behaviors in terms of technologies and bead making and other sorts of things, the stuff at Blombos Cave, uh, by the way, the difference between the chronological dis distance between that, that genetic coalescing of, of, of something and and the coalescing and the dispersion then of these, these remarkably different behaviors is huge, and nobody has a good explanation of it. I think that what uh, uh, my explanation would have again to do with, with the proliferation, the, the gradual, at first, accretion of more and more complex cultural formations, epicyclic cultural formations, and at a certain point, a tipping point being reached whereby these epicycles are, are proliferating hugely rapidly because of the very complexity of communication, of sociality, and, and, uh, uh, and, of, the, and of the brains of these, of these individuals themselves. So I think there's a big difference, um, uh, there's a big difference in behavior between uh, Homo sapiens at 70,000 years ago and Homo sapiens at 170,000 years ago, but I don't think that we have to look for a huge difference genetically in order to explain that difference, that huge difference in behavior. It doesn't have to be a huge difference genetically. We don't need to look for magic bullets, the, the language mutation, and Fox P2 genes, and so on and so forth. We can explain it through the, a different set of means that are a part of this complex web of biocultural coevolution. All right. Yes, please. Uh, we, could we go back to the slide of the human body and the cat's head? Yes, indeed, we could. Yeah. Um, let's see if I know how to get back. Uh, we could. There it is. Yeah. What's on the left? Somebody's making triangles. That's not random scratch. Oh, no, indeed. Indeed, it's not. You, um, on sorry. The on, on the lower left. The lower yes. Left. Oh, no, no. Your no, left. Up here. No, no, no. no, 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 no. There. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, this is extraordinary. This is not random. I didn't say this was random. No, I just wanted to remark. Sorry, it's very good in mathematics. <laughs> well, they're, 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 they're doing something extraordinary with geometrical, geometrical arrangements. And by the way, uh, Paleolithic, Paleolithic caves are and on some very, very old rock shelters in Africa and so on, the dating of which is immensely difficult. These things are filled with geometric figures of various sorts. One interesting place where you, if you want to find a client, kind of cockamamie, but very interesting speculation about such geometrical figures, read a book called The Mind in the Cave by David Lewis Williams. Lewis Williams is the last name, The Mind in the Cave. It's a good read, and, and he makes, a, he makes a, some really good a, a attempts at trying to deal with these geometrical figures. Yeah, yeah. Other questions, please. Yeah, I had a question about, um the, what you were just saying about not looking for a, a single formal, formalizable um, vocabulary for discussing these epicycles. Um, and I guess my question is more about kind of your 
discipline, your intervention within the discipline that you're working in, and it seems to me that you're wanting to argue against a kind of formalism of uh, cognitive processes or cultural processes. Um, and, uh, and I guess I'm just wondering, is there a way to experimentally prove that there's, that there's not a formal sufficient necessary condition for uh, epicyclicity? Because can't someone always come along, can the Chomsky always come along and say, well, actually I do have the, the kind of formal um, essence of this phenomena. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in the process, your, I guess the real question I'm asking is, uh, yeah, can you beat that on its own, on its own terms? Or well, do you have to so, make a kind of moral so, argument? So, 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 okay, uh, 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 can I beat Chomsky on his own terms? That's the, the question. No, no, of course not. <clears throat> no, the, que the question has to do, first of all, there was, a, there was a, an assertion in the question that it seems to me that you're working against formalization. And I, I'm not, in fact. I'm well, working. You're decomposing the, it backwards and backwards. Absolutely, you're absolutely. A lot of earlier things. Yes. So, yeah, therefore, yeah. you're conceding the possibility of formalizing cognitive processes. Um, that are more fundamental or, or earlier. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But isn't the real kind of, I don't know, I want to call it a kind of ethical thrust of your argument to argue that the, our inclination to look for formal, formal features um, as, the, as the kind of essence of music is something that needs to be worked against. Are you, okay. Okay, the, uh, in, pu in pushing back, I think I'm understanding the question, but I'm not yet sure. Uh, in pushing backwards the question of formal, uh, formalization of culture, am I, am, I, uh, uh, am I denying a Chomskyan position that would say, well, I'm going to give you the formal structures, say, in the brain that from which it all comes? Uh, indeed, I am. Um, uh, I don't. Then there are two reasons that you you asked me also about uh, about experimental possibilities. Um, uh, there. <laughs> there are plenty of experiments being done these days in music cognition uh, that point in all kinds of interesting directions. None of them point, in my reading of them, point away from the kind of development that I'm talking about, that I've talked about today. Um, but I would say in regard to, to Chomsky and, and post-Chomskyan approaches, let's just take post-Chomskyan approaches to language. Right? Those approaches have reached largely a dead end, in my view. Um, there, there are some of them that are much more supple and subtle than others in terms of the evolution of language, but there are others that simply throw up their hands. And Chomsky famously threw up his hands and said, we can't explain through natural selective means how language came about. Well, Steven Pinker and Paul Bloom from, from Yale, uh, then in 1991 and 1992, put out a wonderful article that laid out the ways in which we could think of natural selection as bringing about the complexities of cognition and, pr and production and so on that are necessary for language to happen. That was a watershed argument against Chomskyan mysticism, ultimately, is, which is what it, the evolution of language had come to seem in some ways. It was an argument against that, but it wasn't a sufficient argument in my view. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, that, that, uh, that the Bloom and Pinker argument, and especially then the Pinker argument in uh, The Language Instinct or How the Mind Works, those later books, uh, the Bloom and Pinker argument is one that, um, that does not, it is linguocentric in the first place. It does not take account of huge complexities of behavior and technology and everything else that happened among hominins long before language could have existed. It does not then take account of the generative complexity of sociality and culture itself. What's happening between bodies as opposed to just in the brain. Uh, and those things in the model that I've laid out here are tremendously important as forces in the co-evolutionary cycles that I've been talking about. So, um, uh, is there an experiment? Do I want to prove this? I don't want to prove it. I want to argue it as capably as I can. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near proof about any of these huge mysteries about how we came to be the, the creatures we are in the world today. Um, uh, but I think one can argue more effectively with this model that reaches out to the place, space between bodies and works hard at those cultural dynamics. We can explain better with that than with a, a model that is, that is centered in the brain, ultimately. Uh, now, that's not to say, by the way, I, I don't mean to say for a minute that the model, that, that the, what's going on in the brain is not crucially important. It is. Uh, but if you don't have a brain that is, that, is, that is forming itself through natural selective time periods, in the midst of this complex sociality, I don't see how you're going to get anywhere near what we are today. So that's the, that's the way I would, something like the way I would answer the question that I think you asked. <laughs> yeah. Martin, yes. You know, your presentation emphasizes continuity in the long generation of these attributes and mm -hmm. the development of it. Is there, I'm just asking, is there room in this for a concept like Gould's concept of punctuating equilibrium, oh, yes. where oh, yes. things suddenly happen yeah. and stay stable for a yeah. while and yeah. advance in that way yeah. rather than a, a kind of continuous development? 
Yeah, I want to say too. Uh, so the question, the question is, is there room in my in my in my evolutionary view for punctuated equilibrium for the popping up for for uh, periods of stasis that are then followed by uh, a huge leap in, in in evolutionary change? Absolutely, there is room in it, and not only that, it models in cultural terms how such a thing would happen. These epicycles are all about punctuated equilibrium. They are all about things forming that suddenly kick off new cultural and biocultural possibilities. So number one, that it seems to me is the case. The only other thing I'd say in answer to the question is that it's always talked about as Gould's punctuated equilibrium. Read On the Origin of Species. Darwin lays it out right there. He saw that punctuated equilibrium was possible and he lays it right out. I don't know why Gould laid claim to it. He gave it a name so everybody gives it to him, but, uh, but it dates all the way back to On the Origin of Species. Uh, by the way, uh, or, uh, uh, just, a, just a, a little, you know, uh, don't read my book. Leave my book aside, but when it comes out, read On the Origin of Species if you haven't. It is one of the most miraculous books and thought experiments that has ever, that has ever been produced. And he sees so much that is still basic. He sees coevolutionary complexity. He sees the complexity of behaviors and how they would develop in cultures. The case, the case in point being the, the beehive and how it might have come about. He sees punctuated equilibrium. He sees a huge amount all the while having not the slightest idea how inherited variation could have come about. It was all a black box to him, and yet everything around the black box was so clear, so miraculously clear. What a, what a book, what a read. Yes, Martin. Uh, this is a sort of two-fold uh, clarificatory question, I guess. I mean, the first one concerns your, uh, do you say a little more about your definition of musicking and how patient that category mm -hmm. is for you and what sort of work it does? And the second one is, I mean, in your presentation today, I mean, I think you gave a very good sense of you know, the position of your argument is that the very large debates right, of right. evolutionary theory. But then, like, how are you bringing all this to bear on an intervention in musicology? And what are the stakes of that debate in terms of your book? So this is just sort of an invitation to, to paint the broader canvas on your book. Um, so the, the question is, uh, the first part of the question is about, um, oh, remind me, sorry. Um, so, musicking. What, I mean, what do I mean by musicking? Well, yeah. thank you very much, Martin, for that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, anybody want to step up from the music department in the back there and, and uh, uh, leap into this? Um, so that's the first question. The second question, they can also step up in the back and leap into the question of musicology. Where in musicology might, might this discourse uh, subsist? Um, well, this discourse, first of all, um, is, uh, is, is a step aside from the kind of musicology that I have spent most of my career doing. Uh, it's a step to a different terrain, but I don't think, I don't think it is a step uh, that, that simply breaks its ties to musicology. Um, I think that what, what the humanities have done over the last 50 or 60 years is continually and very productively theorize and come to understand human difference. All the while, they call themselves the humanities and they recognize that there was some foundational sameness there that they were not talking about. It is time for the humanities to take, take hold of the conversation about foundational sameness that, that make us all human um, in ways that are more than the platitudes about what it means to be human. That's what, you know, that's what, I don't know, listening to Beethoven is an affirmation of what it means to be human. Well, I think that actually, I feel that very strongly and yet it doesn't tell me much specifically about what it means to be human. Um, so, the, hum the humanities have been the humanities of difference tremendously productively. They now need to be both the humanities of difference and the humanities of human sameness. Um, and and, and I, think, I think every humanistic discipline needs to be thinking about this. If we don't think about it, there are cognitive scientists and a whole bunch of other people out there, many of whom are my good friends, who want to think about it. And they simply don't have the training in the, in, in, in the humanities necessarily to understand as well as they should what it is they're, trying, what it is they're aiming at. This is the case of Pinker's uh, treatment of music and how the mind works. It's a shameful treatment of music. He read Fred Lairdall and, and, and Ray Jackendoff on the hierarchic structures of music and he said, oh, I've got it all now. And that was it, right? Um, and so he dismisses it as piggybacking on language and having no independent status of its, of its own, which I object to just because I'm a musician and a musicologist. But uh, I object also because it seems to me that this is not the phenomenon that I know as music, right? Um, so then you asked about the definition of musicking. Well, I mean, I've given you a pretty good idea here, as, as best I can, probably. I'm not, sure that, I'm not sure that I can sum it up in a, in a phrase or two. It is capacious. It is necessarily capacious. It is a, a sense of something that, is, uh, that probably has to do with indexical signs rather than symbols. It has to do with a, a kind of extraordinarily complexly ordered set of indexical signs and percepts that are produced that are not carrying meaning the way language does, even though it then gets surrounded in human behavior by language and comes to carry all kinds of meanings. Um, so musicking, musicking is, is a very, very complex, it's, I think it's a unique 
human feature. I, to, to name something else that, that puts together in such a complex fashion constructions out of non-referential signals and signs is almost impossible to do in human, in human behavior, it seems to me. And is, there, is there anywhere in your account a threshold where we go from non-musicking to musicking? Say again, I didn't hear. Is there anywhere in your account a threshold where we go from non-musicking to musicking, or is that capacious as your entire presentation? The, the, the question was, is there, is there a threshold from non-musicking to musicking? Um, is there a chronological, I would say, threshold from non-musicking to musicking? I think there is a, co a momentous coalescence, but I think it's got to be over a very long span. Now, the other thing I will say in answer to that is that the, incremental, the incrementalism of the account suggests that, when this, that, that there can be no moment in which a group of behaviors is coherently together and then shifts from non-musicking to musicking. What you have to have is components that coalesce at a certain point and I think coalesce together with language and coalesce together with metaphysical perceptions, the imaginary realm. All of these, I think, are coalescing in human behavior and human capacities at about the same time um, out of these mechanisms, these epicyclic mechanisms. That's the argument, um, uh, and it's laid out in a greater detail in, in, in the book as to how that, how that might work. But in that, there is a capacious view of musicking, but there's no moment at which non-musicking becomes musicking, not at, at least a, unless a moment is thought of in a very, very broad terms. Yes. As not. Middle, there's no criterion by which I could say this is musicking or non-musicking, even if I didn't want to give an account of like a yeah, yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's still a criterion that for what would be so simple that it would no longer count as part of musicking. Uh, you know, if, if, what, I, I've, already, I, I've, I've already, in a sense, um, said probably what I have to say and I answer that. The, the, uh, the question was, are there criteria, a criteria by which we might say this is music but this is not music? Um, yes, I think there are. I think they have to do with things like uh, a very precise kind of entrainment of individuals listening to other individuals, working with other individuals, that is not found in the same fashion in language, even though entrainment of, of more general sorts is hugely important in language. A very precise kind of entrainment, on the one hand, a very precise kind of uh, uh, deployment of this capacity to process and perceive discrete pitch, on the other hand, and you start putting these things together into complex structures, and that's the moment at which it seems to me to happen. I don't know whether that's the threshold you wanted, but it's, it's as close as I can get right now. Yeah, yeah. There's a question in the back. Okay. Yes, Michael. I'm going to intervene. Oh, okay. okay. <clears throat> I'm sure there are many more questions, but fortunately, we're about to have a reception, and Gary will uh, join us uh, next door in the common room, so thank each you. of you can ask some questions. But let me first thank you for coming to our Company of Scholars lecture this year. Thank Gary for a splendid, thought-provoking uh, presentation invite you all to the reception and then uh, express my hope that my successor next year will continue the company of scholars lectures because they've been so much fun. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.